I wasn't I wasn't near any running stores, so I I picked up a salt shaker and like you would find me on the side of the road just like taking hits of uh, of salt just to just to stay normal. Hello, Ron. My name is Flores Germann. Welcome to the Extra Miles podcast, where I interview the brightest mind in health, fitness, and nutrition. And we talk about a variety of different topics, including one of my favorites, how to become a stronger, healthier, and happier athlete. Today's guest on the show is Pete Kostelnik. I don't know anyone else who has run as many miles as Pete has. This year alone, he has already passed 10,000 miles. One thing he did recently was run all the way from Alaska down to Florida. That was almost 5,400 miles in 97 days. That's more than two marathons a day. He also has the Guinness World Record running coast to coast in America from San Francisco to New York in only 42 days where he ran 72 miles a day. And besides that, he has won many different races, including a course record holder of the Badwater 135. In today's episode, we talk about Pete's training, his approach to racing, um, injury prevention, obviously with high mileage, how he prevents getting injured. We talk about nutrition and about motivation as well. I think this episode is interesting, not only for the ultra runner out there, but also for other athletes. We talk about marathon running, even for half marathons, different training approaches. Um, I had a really fun time with this conversation and definitely think many of you will enjoy it as well. Um, as always, all of the show notes from this episode can be found on my website, extramilist.com. Hope you enjoy my conversation with Pete Kostelnik. Let's jump right in over here. How are you doing? Where, where are you at right now? I'm in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, back uh, just at home. So Right on. Good. Yep. First of all, I want to say congrats, man. I've been following your journey every single day. You just ran all the way from Alaska to Florida. <laughs> Incredible! It was it was very fun to see your daily updates on uh, on Instagram every day about ten photos whenever you had phone reception. Yeah. Wow! Wow! Maybe we can start out with with just diving right into it. Can you tell us a little bit more some of the details about the adventure and some of the things that you experienced? Yeah, yeah. So um, you know, I started up in uh, Kenai, Alaska, on July thirty first. Um, kind of changed my mind about eight, nine, 10 times before I even started on whether I wanted to even, even start the run, but uh -huh. <laughs> somehow, uh, found myself outside, uh, um, my motel in Kenai town on July 31st at 3 AM. Uh, I didn't really know what I was doing. I had my stroller there with me and a lady named summer came and picked me up and, uh, drove me about an hour down to, um, down to Anchor Point on the Kenai Peninsula, which is as far west as you can go on uh, U.S. highways. Mm -hmm. And uh, the funny thing about that ride down in the dark was it was, uh, she's she, the first thing she told me when we got in the car was, all right, look for bears and moose on your side of the truck. And so I was like, and that was the road I was going to have to run on the first day. I was like, okay, I'll, I'll do that. And um, I was, you know, it was a pretty, uh, pretty incredible journey, though, like just, starting out in Alaska, um, very desolate, very quiet, you know, didn't have like, didn't even have my wife or anybody mm -hmm. join me for the start. Um, and you know, I told myself when I went up there, you know, if, if things don't look right, if something goes wrong, you know, by day three or four in Anchorage, um, just call it, just, you yeah. know, don't, don't put yourself in, uh, don't, don't get, don't get, um, you know, too far in that you, you just, something goes wrong you can't get out of here so um you know it went really well though like you know by day day even by day two I was like in my element again I was like this is what I'm made to do and it was just I was having a lot of fun and you know the fun just never really stopped from that point on <laughs> and uh um you know get the first 35 days I was on the Alaska highway um and I didn't really see any but I didn't really run with anybody those first you know that first month or so uh, it was really just me by myself. That, that, uh, must, that must have been quite lonely at some at, at times when you're like running a full like 10, 12 hour day. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, it was it was very interesting. It, it, you know, I learned a lot about myself just, you know, just 
things I already kind of knew, but just it was just kind of nice to be out there by myself and honestly just seeing uh, pine trees on, you know, just as far as the eye can see, millions of pine trees. I called them my uh, my cheering squad. Like, <laughs> I, I just imagine it being like the Tour de France with, you know, it's, instead of having people lining the, the road, it, it was a bunch of trees lining the road. And uh -huh. uh, it was just incredible because, like, when I would stop, you know, to take a break, I would just look off into the woods and be like, there's probably never even been a human being, like, in that part of the forest or anything. So, mm -hmm. um, let alone a human running down those roads. Um, so yeah, it was just a really surreal experience, uh, you know, to see such amazing, uh, lakes, mountains, rivers, um, glaciers, and just, you know, starting off in the, along the ocean there in the Kenai Peninsula. Um, and then, you know, it, it's, I started to get down, uh, you know, it, it, once I, you know, I kind of replaced scenery with people once I got to Southern Canada, um, where the scenery kind of changed more into like wheat fields and oil country. Mm -hmm. But that's where I really started to, I was kind of blown away, you know, just about every single day from Southern Canada through the whole rest of the run. Um, you know, the last two thirds, second half of the run, um, I had people join me just about every day and it was just an incredible experience to, um, meet so many people, uh, and really, you know, get to know them really well. And, um, and then, you know, meet up with old friends and even people that the only time I'd seen them before was when I ran across America two years ago, uh, I had several people that came out and ran with me again. And, um, that was a really cool experience as well. It was just, just so, so many great memories. And, you know, I, I kind of compare it, you know, running across America, uh, from Alaska to Florida is like having Disney world all to myself with no lines. And then, you know, running across America two years ago is like Disneyland and just standing in line all day, you know, it's, it's great, but it's not nearly as cool as, you know, the big, the big diverse Alaska to Florida adventure that I, I just went on. Yeah. Because, because those were two complete different adventures that way. Right. Like the, the last one you just did was all fully self-supported. You were running with a stroller and the one two years ago in 2016, you had an actual crew and you had a vehicle that you slept in at night. Like, what was for you mentally like the difference of now having to go through this all on your own? Like, can you, can you talk about that part a bit more? Yeah. You know, I had to be a lot, um, a lot more patient. Um, I just had, you know, the main thing was when, when I did it two years ago, running from San Francisco to New York, uh, you know, I could take, take some risks as far as like, uh, you know, you, you, you injure yourself or you have some, so, something kind of go wrong. Someone will, is there to take care of it for you. Um, you know, I never even had to think about finding food or anything mm -hmm. like that, um, or carrying anything with me. Cause I had a, an amazing crew with me the whole, um, whole way. But, uh, you know, running from Alaska, to Florida, it's like, you know, you have to think about everything. You have to think about, do I have enough water? Do I have enough food? Uh, those are two main things. But then, where am I going to stay tonight? Um, sometimes I didn't even know if a place actually existed until I actually ran right up to it. Um, and sometimes it would like, it would just be a little clearing in the trees, like a lodge or something or a cabin or a campground. Mm -hmm. And and so I'd be like, ah, I think it's a mile up, but I don't see anything. And then all of a sudden you're like right there. Okay. Th there it is. And, um, sometimes it was just staying at like a little, a mo like a gas station would have a few rooms, um, in the back <laughs> where you could stay. Um, things like that. So it was just, you know, and that was the thing I actually liked the most about it was it was really kind of a game of chess up in Alaska and the Yukon and uh, British Columbia um, because, you know, you have to, there were, you know, five, six days sometimes between towns where they had a grocery store. And so um, sometimes it was 200 kilometers between gas stations. And um, so, you know, I had to think, um, days and days ahead, you, you know, I couldn't just think about the next day. It was, I have to think about the next, um, almost the next province or <laughs> wherever, <laughs> wherever. And so, um, yeah, it was, you know, that was what I really actually started to like. And then I actually, once I got, um, down into the United States again and, um, North Dakota and then further South where, you know, I saw big gas stations with all the amenities just about every day. It was actually kind of sad cause I, had it too easy. And, um, yeah, it was, 
Yeah, I really love that. And then uh, I had some stretches up in the Yukon where I had to do, um, it, it, it was really inconsistent too. Like when I ran across the U.S. in 2016, it was almost every single day it was 70 to 75 miles. Um, for, and how, this, for how many days was that? That was uh, 42 days and change. Um, and this was, this was uh, so that was about 3,100 miles. And this was about 5,400 miles um, from Kenai to Key West. And uh, my, my average was 55 miles a day. But, um, you know, more, more times than not, it would be 65 miles one day, 42 the next, 75 the next, 30 the next. And so it was really just based on where I could find places to stay, um, knowing that all I had for camping gear was a tiny little a-frame tent and an <laughs> inflatable pillow and i didn't really have so anytime i i only had to camp a few times and anytime i camped it was just um really it was just set up camp nap and then you know get a couple hours of sleep and then get back out on the road wow so talk, talk about the food part a little bit because you just mentioned some days you wouldn't have any opportunity to buy new food for several days what would you stock up on? Because you would have a stroller that you could put things in, but things becomes pretty heavy as well. So what, what would you bring along the way? Yeah, you know, I've, I found a lot of calorie dense foods um, that were mostly non-perishable or could last over a week. Um, my One of my biggest go-tos was trail mix. Uh, I would have like a gigantic Ziploc bag that I would uh, just pour trail different brands of trail mix in along the way. So I had mm -hmm. like this giant bag of like, um, it was probably like 10 different brands and 20 different kinds of trail mix. <laughs> it was like everything Classic. you can, any type of trail, anything that would be considered trail mix was, was in that bag. <laughs> and, uh, so that, you know, that got me through, you know, I, it was, it was probably like 10 to 15,000 calories of food in one bag of trail mix. Um, so that got me through a lot of long stretches. Um, but, uh, also like, for, you know, I wouldn't say higher quality food, but, uh, you know, a little more substance, I would pack chili, um, cans of chili, uh, are pretty, were pretty common, like at some of those little gas stations up there. Mm -hmm. Um, you're not going to find like any warm breakfast sandwiches or like anything like that up there. So it's, if you could find a sandwich in a gas station up along the Alaska highway, that was like, you know, almost unheard of. So just a lot of like non-perishable foods like, uh, you know, like chill, like I actually had a can of chili that, um, made it all the way to Key West, I think from the Yukon. Cause I just kind of kept it in there for good luck. No way. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, so it's kind of stuff like that. And, um, you know, it, it pretty unhealthy stuff too, like, um, yeah, like fruit snacks, um, can like candy bars, uh, I did a lot of Snickers bars and um, things like that as well, just to kind of keep the calories going throughout the day. Um, and, you know, a lot of times there, if I stayed at like a, a gas station that had like a motel or um, a lodge, they would have a restaurant. So I would have like a, a gigantic feast um, at night, like a, a burger or two and, um, you know, whatever, else, like a, a big salad as well mm -hmm. if, if they had. But it, it was funny because uh, one lady told me in – uh, Beaver Creek, Yukon, I'll never forget this, right on the Alaska-Yukon border, um, where you're really out in the middle of nowhere. They're, they didn't even have a grocery store there, and it was like the only town for a long time. I remember asking her if they had any, like, fresh sandwiches at the at uh, at this convenience store, and she's like, "Hun, if you're looking for uh, looking for lettuce around here, it's like uh, cigarettes in a prison like you're, it's just like <laughs> <laughs> you're just not gonna find it and if you do someone's already taken it <laughs> classic did you did you feel the did you did you need to supplement with anything like did you feel your body needed certain things that you couldn't really get out of the food there yeah it's funny um the first day of the run i was really lucky that i didn't start the run earlier because it was pretty good weather so i didn't have to replenish salt too much because uh, mm -hmm. that's the one thing i i, I I sweat out salt like no, but nobody's nobody else. And so, um, I actually like, I had a, a, a couple I met on the flight into Anchorage. were going to meet up with me and, uh, they asked me if I needed anything. And like, this is the first day and I was, um, just texting them and, and I forgot like, Oh, I'm self-supported. So I, I told them, pick me up some, uh, like some, uh, salt caps or Endurolites or something. And 
And then <laughs> they brought it out to me, and I and I remembered I couldn't take it from them because I wanted to stay fully self-supported. So I actually just picked up a a salt shaker at a <laughs> at a you know I couldn't I wasn't I wasn't near any running stores, so I I picked up a salt shaker and like you would find me on the side of the road just like taking hits of uh, of salt just to just to stay normal. And then uh, after that, you know, I found I, I did a lot of uh, sports drinks um, as well to kind of get my electrolytes back up because that was that was one thing I, I didn't really think through going into the run <laughs> I was thinking I was thinking more like food and logistics and then I was just like I forgot about the whole running aspect mm-hmm. of the adventure <laughs> yeah so so you didn't take any gels or or any cliff bars or those kind of things like it was more no, I, whatever you would find along the way yeah and and once I got um once I got further into the run I did a lot um it, it, I did a lot of cliff bars. It, it's funny to this to this day. Anytime I go into a gas station, I'm I, like the first thing I think of is where are the cliff bars? <laughs> Where's the Gatorade? <laughs> um, and just like where if they have where and if they have sandwiches, pick up a couple. And so mm. I have to remind myself, like, yeah, you're not in you're not in transcon mode anymore. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So you ran about two marathons a day for 97 days. How in the world? did you train for that and how in the world do you prevent injuries as well as you go through some of that yeah you know the, the funny thing is you know um you know i think a lot of it was from doing the 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 transcon in 2016 uh from san francisco to new york um as far as like building up my durability um you know it, the recovery from from running across america in 2016 was a lot slower than I wanted it to be, but at the same time, um, you know, I, I you know, I, it was almost a mistake year. Like 2017, I'll be the like the the year after I ran across America, I'll be the first to say that I I overtrained. I was doing too many uh, 200 mile weeks, um, and you know, doing doing two a days, like 15 miles before work, 15 miles after work type of type of stuff. And the you know the 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 positive out of that was you know, doing a transcon with, you know, 40, 50, 60 miles a day was almost, I'm not going to say it was easy, but it was like the recovery was a lot easier for me, I think, than, than most people. Cause my legs were just so used to, uh, to used to kind of going through that every day that, um, it, it, yeah, it, it was, I was, I was amazed. The only, the only real, issue I had was my Achilles would tighten up here and there, um, just with all the miles and, and pushing the stroller too added a little bit more, um, push off I needed, uh, from the Achilles. And so, yeah, it was, it was incredible. Like <laughs> I wasn't really, I wasn't, you know, I, I think I've been in better shape before, like, um, speed wise, but as far as durability wise, I came in, um, into 2017 and 2018 with, with, uh, a good, a good base going. So what was like your your weekly training miles? Like I, the the part I like about you a lot is you you share all of your runs on Strava, so people can actually and I'll put make sure to put a link in the show notes as well. Um, you you still run your training volume leading into this was was still relative high, right? You were training for Badwater, mm-hmm. um, yeah. Like you had a few different races going on, then then going on to Badwater, and then this adventure was pretty fast after. What what is like your training base like at that point? Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I had a lot of, a lot of this year, even I had a lot of 150 to 200 mile weeks. Um, I did, did, you know, I did a few 24 hour races that, you know, weren't great performances, but they were great, um, mileage getters, I guess you could say. (laughs) Um, I did a six day race, uh, and that was a, a good test. And, you know, before I knew it, I'd, I'd already done, you know, so many, longer races you know i went out on the appalachian trail for um five days with uh, harvey lewis on his Mm -hmm. appalachian trail attempt so i mixed it up a little bit better this year but i was still um you know i I still had some 150 mile weeks and just normal training as well and uh yeah you know i i think um i think i went in i think i went into you know uh the this run with a good four thousand miles um, through like the first half of the year. Uh, so I was still, yeah, I was getting a lot of miles in and, you know, I got, I'm sitting here today in the early December with, uh, just over 9,700 miles for the year. 
uh, after those 5,400. Unbelievable. Um, you think you're going to break so, 10, 10K this year? You I think, think so. That, yeah, that's my goal because, you know, I'm going out to Desert Solstice this weekend. It's, um, you know, I'll be the first to admit I, I'm not really looking to do anything crazy out there, but I'll probably get hopefully at least a hundred miler in. And, um, so yeah, I'll be pretty, I'll pretty knocking on the door here pretty soon. <laughs> and, uh, you know, in 2016, I got to 90, I think I got to like 96, 9,700 miles, um, that year. So it would be kind of cool to, to break 10,000 miles, uh, at yeah. least once in a year. That would be, that would probably be one that must be the highest amount of miles run on Strava in a year, wouldn't it? Maybe on Strava, you know, I, I think there were, you know, some crazy um, guys like uh, th- there was a Lin- Lindgren guy back in the day that would he was he would do a lot of 200 mile and he was like a 5K runner and he, he was putting in like 200 plus miles every week for a wow. really long time. So, uh, yeah, there you know, it there's probably not more than, you know, I, I couldn't I'd have to guess not more than a few dozen people that have ever done 10,000 miles in a year. So yeah, that's, that's definitely, cool. definitely building up the miles right there. You probably run more in a year than most people run in their lifetime that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, real quick, going back to like, like the training part, but also the injury prevention and, and the injuries, like, would you do a lot of stretching, rolling, proper warm up, cool downs, like what, like ice bath? What would it look like for you, like during training, like during the high mileage, but also once you start going on some of these adventure runs? Yeah, um, you know, I, I I I don't stretch much before I run, um, but I do. I, I was a little bit bit better about stretching every morning on the this run just because it felt better because I was so stiff. Um, you know, waking up and, you know, even if, if I'm off my feet for 14 hours, it's still a little hard to get going. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of stretching before running in general. Um, but me me neither. um, I'll be the first one to admit. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I like to just kind of, you know, sometimes I, I get a little ahead of myself, go out too hard on a run on training run and the the start, but ideally I like to kind of go out easy and just use like the first mile or two is like my, uh, my stretching um, just kind of a natural form. But, um, once I'm done, you know, getting, uh, I, I usually like to stretch for a good, uh, you know, if I can get 10 to 15 minutes of stretching, that'd be great. I usually don't go much, much past that after I'm done. Um, but you know, I think, you know, a lot of it is, uh, you know, building, um, a lot, a lot of slower base. I, I do a lot of slower miles. So I think, um, you can build a lot of durability if you just go, you know, you, you do, I, I don't do much quality. I, I want to do more quality uh, workouts, but um, you know, even when I'm like in peak form, I don't usually do more than one or two faster. Like I, I call it more like a, a test run, like testing my limits. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas you know, I, I know some people that go hard almost every day, and that's why I think how they get injured is they just you know they're really testing their body's um, ability yeah. to to go that extra gear so well and, and that's why you're probably able to put in these higher volume training weeks as well right being able to run up to 150 or 200 mile training weeks like if you would be hammering out high intensity workouts your recovery is going to go right out of the window really absolutely you, you yep. might be able to maintain that for a little bit but at the end of the day that's that's short-term gains versus long-term really Yep. Yep. And I don't really take a time. Like, you know, I, I, last year I, I, in 2017, I took a couple of months, um, off running completely, but yeah, I don't, I don't really do like a, a, a big down see like a, take a big break either. Um, I like to train through the winter if I can. And, um, but, but yeah, I don't, I don't do a whole lot of quality. I think, and that's the funny thing is there, there's been times where I, all I did was slow, easy, long, long training runs. And I was hitting PRs just because, my legs were like, I was just a different type of runner. My legs were just strong. Like, and, and, you know, my, my cardio was great. Cause I was, I was moving so much and I got so efficient that I, I only had to do like a tempo run, like once every two or three weeks, just to kind of maintain some of that higher gear. Isn't it unbelievable how you can actually with a lot of slower, slower runs, slower pace, lower heart rate runs, still be able to PR. Can you, can you talk a little mm-hmm. bit more about that? Because yeah. you, back in the day, like about 10 years ago, like you got into marathon running and you, you even ran Boston. Can you, can you talk about that experience? 
Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, I I never really had a coach, so um, you know, I, I had a like a coach in high school, but that was about it. And I've had people that wanted to like kind of guide me, and, they, and a couple people have. But um, when I was when I was training, when I, I qualified for Boston in 2009 uh, on my second marathon, and uh, I ran it in 2010. Although I was kind of injured, I kind of just did it anyway, and uh, and. Yeah, like I, you know, I've not, I'm not like a super speedy guy. I wanted to break three hours for a while. And, you know, I, I thought the only, the way to break three hours is to like run a three hour marathon pace, like for eight to 12 miles every day and just kind of, <laughs> kind of just push through it and not, not really, don't do any real slow running because like slow running is for, uh, old people, I guess. And, um, so then I kind of just like, I, kind of just thought, you know, I wasn't really cut out for marathons anymore. And so I, I started doing ultras in 2011 and, uh, kind of got away from marathon and marathoning for a, a few years and, um, came back and, uh, in 2015, I ran, um, the Lincoln marathon in Nebraska where I lived, uh, just kind of on a, more on a whim doing more ultra, ultra long, long distance, uh, long, slow distance training. And I got a 241 PR, and it was like a hot day as well. And I got I got third. Wow! Uh, nice, nice little cash prize. To link. <laughs> it's a pretty good, you know, pretty competitive marathon. So, um, yeah, I, you know, I think uh, that you know, if you're an ultra runner, it doesn't mean you have to say goodbye to. Mm-hmm. And I think I got all my PRs that year. I got a 5K, 10K PR as well. Just kind of <laughs> doing long, slow, easy training for the most part. Wow. Yeah, so we, we have a lot of listeners in the audience um, that are half marathon runners, a lot of marathon runners who are looking to qualify for Boston or running a PR in a marathon or a sub three hour marathon. What what would you say to some of these people? Like, what do you think works has worked well for you in your training? Yeah, um, you know, another thing, you know, I, I do most of my training, honestly, 95% of it probably by myself. Uh, and, <laughs> Um, you know, I think for a lot of people, it's a struggle to get the miles in. Um, and you know, I've, I, you know, I like to do, you know, I love to do group runs, but I like to kind of save them more for like when I'm tapering or, you know, try to strategically put it into my schedule so that, you know, I'm not completely abandoning all social aspects of Mm -hmm. (laughs) running, but, um, but yeah. And, and then just doing, um, just signing up for races really too. Like I've, I've kind of hit points in my training where I'm like okay I need like I need like a big six month window to really be ready for this like really daunting you know six day race or or whatever and um you know that usually I think it's it's good to naturally if you're kind of like me and you get a little ahead of yourself on training sometimes it's it's good to mix in races uh even if you know you're not gonna do that great um like I'm going out to desert solstice this weekend for a 24 hour track (laughs) race. And I don't have really any business being there from a, uh, personally from my, my own competitive standpoint. Um, but I'm going out there anyways, just to kind of keep myself honest and kind of just force myself to enjoy and kind of, I think it keeps the, the motivation and inspiration there too, when you're around, Mm -hmm. um, great runners. And so just, you know, signing up for races and, and mixing them in and just knowing that like, you know, not because, you know, I, I kind of look at some of the, you know, elite runners, um, on the national stage and, you know, I, I kind of feel bad cause they, you know, they do two marathons a year and like, if it's not the, if they don't have a good race or if they're, they go in sick, then they kind of, you know, I'm not going to say they wasted all that time training, mm-hmm. but, um, but yeah, I think, I think for, you know, the, the average person, uh, you know, keeping the, keeping the schedule full and just kind of keeping the, the fire alive is, uh, it's been huge for me in my training. It's, it's that fine line, right? Between like wanting to keep the fire alive and being motivated and be, be out there and checking into what your fitness level is yet. At the other hand, you don't want to overdo it because you might mm-hmm. burn yourself out or you might exactly yep. set, you, set yourself back a little bit further in training again, if you sure. push yourself too hard in that race. And yeah, that's a, yep. How do you deal, like when I look at you from the outside, I see someone who's incredibly motivated to get up day in, day out to put the work in, especially during some of these adventures, but even even during regular training weeks. How do you motivate yourself? Like, are there any special ways, any 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 strategies there that work for you? 
Um, yeah, you know, I, I, uh, I guess for me personally, it's, um, trying to beat myself from pe- previous years. Uh, cause that's kind of the way I've always been, uh, wired. Um, and that's why like, you look at my running past and like each year, like I, I haven't, I don't think I've always, I've always kept my miles somewhere that I've my training miles. And so like when I first started marathon training, it was like, more i think i was already up in like a 50 60 70 mile week range and every year it was like i gotta do more i gotta do more i gotta do more now like i think 2016 2017 i kind of hit a breaking point where i couldn't outdo it so it was i had to kind of flip it around a little bit and kind of um look for other ways to to keep improving but um i think that's that's one thing that kind of gets me going is uh just I, I love the the I, I don't like it. I hate when people call it the process, but I love the the process of uh, getting back, um, you know, aiming for a goal, um, you know, and, and seeing progress. I think that's what that's my favorite thing about running is, you know, compared to other sports um, from a young age is that, you know, you kind of control your own destiny and yeah. um, it's a very easy sport to see progress. And so um, really, you know keeping a lot like I know some people that never write down any of their miles or record anything. And to me, that'd be impossible. Like I think I would give up right away because I think for me, it's, I love to see progress. I love to, you know, know that, you know, I went for a 10 mile run at the same pace as I did a week ago, but it felt twice as easy this week and, and, and things like that. So uh, I think that's what keeps me most motivated. That that part I fully agree with and experience it myself as well. Um, I run with a heart rate monitor quite a bit and I go to a track usually once a month to kind of measure progress as well. Like running at the same heart rate, doing like a MAF test. Um, and from there, it, it's fascinating. Once you start building up a training cycle again and let's say at 145 heart rate, the one month you might be running like an eight minute pace and then an, another month later a 7.30 minute pace and the next month is 7.10 minute pace. And just to see how quickly you can, can pro- progress really in like the same mm-hmm. heart rate, it, it's quite fascinating that way. So. Yep. Yeah, I remember, you know, like when I first started running with my wife after I took a few months off, like way back in 2009. And then more recently, just a year ago, after I'd taken some time off, like just running like a 10 minute mile, you know, out of the blue, after taking a few months off, you're just like, <laughs> how am I ever like, you know, in, and then to like think that like I could do this easily for 24 hours, like, mm-hmm. you know, six months from now. But it's like right now I'm just like huffing and puffing to get through a few miles. It's really incredible how like quickly you can improve. Um, in running. And that's not only pace-wise, but that's distance-wise as well. Because yep. a lot of people might have run up to a marathon distance, but anywhere beyond that, it's a gray zone. They've never experienced it until you start doing your first 50k, your 31 mile, and and like that zone, you just expand your horizon. And once you have done it, that almost becomes the next norm. Yep. And then from there, I remember once I went from 31k uh, mile to 35 mile to 50 mile to 100, like you keep expanding your horizon that way and it becomes less scary over time. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I remember the first time I did a, I did a 20k um, race when I was a senior in high school and I couldn't believe, like I, I felt so cool, like privileged to be there because I see like the people with like the mesh hats and like I never done a race where you know you have the like the old old timers and the marathoners there and i was like wow i'm all, like i'm almost to a half marathon and like thinking that was like ridiculously far and like literally like i you know people you know can't believe that a lot of times but i used to think that running a half marathon was like unbelievably far and now it's like you know it feels like a sprint to me to go out and do a 13 mile like tempo run <laughs> yeah yeah exactly exactly um, I want to go back to your Alaska to Florida um, adventure a little bit more into detail. So can you describe some of your highlights or a few of the things that you remember as like being a really good day, something you experienced that you're like, oh, that was one of my favorite days of the trip? Yep. Yep. Um, you know, uh, I remember day. So the first four days it was really just kind of um, negotiating my way out of the Kenai Peninsula and into like mainland Alaska. Um, and I remember on day five, um, I was kind of 
getting past the Anchorage Palmer area on like the busy, like the busiest highway that goes through there. And the second I turned off that highway, um, onto the Glen highway heading East, um, kind of into no man's land. It just, I just remember this, you know, kind of like being in a star Wars movie with all the cars zooming by you, like flying by you. It was like zoom, 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 zoom. And then, uh, two minutes later I was off on this quiet, it was so peaceful. And I was just off into the woods. I was, it was like I had gone into like a whole different world. Um, Mm -hmm. and I just remember that day. Um, also because I, I I think I I camped that night and I met a lady, um, older lady, uh, who, um, bought me, uh, lunch and a a couple beers at this, uh, bar, um, in, uh, camera, it was near Chickaloon, this, uh, I think it was Sutton, uh, Sutton Roadhouse. And it was just like the most amazing place I'd ever like set foot in it was just this gigantic pioneer town bar with that was like untouched we were the only ones there um and that that was just a really fun day and then you know i camped that night uh, i met a lot of really nice couples from there on um the through all the way through alaska and, and the yukon and british columbia but that was just a really cool day because it was like going off into into the you know, an abyss and just like, you're just like, you don't know what to expect. And, um, but, and then, and then the days after that, I just, and, um, the next day seeing like gigantic mountains and glaciers, um, in Alaska and just kind of being blown away by how beautiful it was. Um, and then in, in the Yukon, I saw some really amazing, uh, lakes there, just that some of them that stretched like 50, 60 miles long. And, um, you know, not seeing any like commercial commercialization at all. It was just kind of like you had the, 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 this giant lake all to yourself. Um, it, it, no it, almost, around. It, it must almost feel like a time is standing still in some of those zones, right? Like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and you know, a lot, like some of those places hadn't really changed much. I don't think since I, uh, my family and I drove up the Alaska highway in 1999 and here we are almost 20 years later and like, nothing had really changed in some of those places, uh, which was incredible. But, um, yeah, I just met, I met so many people, like it was just every day, day was unique up on the Alaska highway. I was staying, I, I stayed in cabins. I stayed in, um, gas stations. I stayed in like above a bar. I've stayed, like, I just stayed like everywhere you can kind of imagine, mm-hmm. uh, along the Alaska highway is like every place was unique. And it was based on like what the, you know, the owners wanted you know saw in that place and so um you know some of them had like a gigantic big screen tv in a cabin and then some of them had like a you know didn't have a tv at all or didn't you know it was just like a very rough and rough and tumble type of place and so it was it was awesome because that was like the the fun of each day was like i had no idea where i was staying or what where you know what it was going to be like where i got to the end of the day it was just some a new place to live for a day and um kind of i kind of felt like i was you know, the resident of wherever I was, you know, even if I was only in that, um, province or state for six or seven days, um, I kind of felt like I was like living there and I didn't have to worry about anything else in the world. Um, but you know, as I got further South, uh, you know, I, you know, Southern Canada was, um, was interesting because it was a lot of busier highway, um, kind of like running on their interstates. They, um, but it was uh, a lot of great people that I met down there. Um, what were what were some of the? Do you, do you have a few people that stand out to you? Like mm-hmm. some, some stories of people along the way that you came across? Yeah, there there were a lot. Yeah, you know, I had a lot of interesting stories. You know, one that stands out was in Saskatchewan. Um, a few guys came out to run with me one day, and it just just it was just like a perfect day after it had been raining like nonstop, um, and then of course it rained nonstop after that. Um, but, uh, yeah, that, that was an incredible day in North Dakota. Um, my cousin's boyfriend, uh, is from the, um, Valley city area and the the cross country team came out and ran with me one day and, uh, it seemed like everybody in town knew who I was. (laughs) That's Um, awesome. And yeah, it was just, it was incredible there. Um, in Iowa, I ran through coming into Iowa was just like, I felt like a celebrity even coming through like towns I'd never been to, like people just coming up one after another to say hi. And, um, that was 
pretty incredible as well. Um, and, and just like getting, getting to, you know, there were days where I was meeting new people. There were days where I was catching up with relatives. And then there were days, um, like in Eastern Iowa and Illinois where like, um, a few of my friends came out that had been, that had crewed for me in a lot of different of my running attempts. And they kind of came out and just, they knew they couldn't crew for me, but they spent the day with me. And, um, uh, it was Jody, Dill, and, and Brad, and I'll never forget those two days either. Um, it's, and it's, then it's nice yep. when you can mix it up. Some of the the lonely days with with being surrounded by people as well. I'm sure. It yeah, kind of breaks up yep. the day. I'm sure. Yeah, and then and then you know getting to and then once I got into the southeast, um, I, I'd been to all of the states down there, but I never really spent time in them uh, any meaningful amount of time, especially in Alabama and Georgia. Um, and that was just incredibly eye-opening to, you know, see, you know, I'd grown up and grown up in cornfields all my life. Everywhere I live is surrounded by cornfields. So going down there and, uh, seeing cotton fields and pecan trees and all sorts of orchards was just like pretty cool too in itself. Um, and then Florida, you know, I can't, Florida was 11 days of just awesomeness, like just reflecting on the entire run and 11 days you're in florida it's a long state huh yeah yeah it's weird because it's it's not you know a a very wide state but it's very (laughs) long state and uh so yeah the florida was was incredible as well and um and you know the the finish like i i I like to tell people it's not about the finish it's about the journey and you know key west is just where it happened to end but um that last day i you know i i specifically um, asked nobody to run with me the entire day. Cause I just wanted to like think back on the entire journey. And then, uh, it was like the hottest day of the whole run and the ch- well, actually most challenging. Cause it was, you know, it was the day before was 75 miles, but the last day or 77 or something. Um, and the last day was just a nice little quick 50 miler, but it was like, I was literally just like on empty the last 10 miles. Cause, and I told, and I remember telling everybody, I think I'll finish between two and three in the afternoon. And then all of a sudden, like two thirty crept up on me and I was still three or four miles out. And I just like, I just turned the finish into race mode. And it was like, <laughs> it was perfect. Cause it was like the whole entire run. I was taking my time being patient and then coming to Key West. I was, I was probably cutting off cars, like t- taking sharp turns, being very stupid. But you know, at the last second I got to Key West at two fifty seven uh, three with three minutes to spare. And it was like just a lot of fun to, to finish there. And, um, it was really cool because no one, uh, not very few people came down to the finish and that's kind of the way I actually secretly mm-hmm. wanted it. Um, I didn't want to tell like my family or close friends, like, don't come see me finish or don't surprise me. But it was really just my wife and, uh, some friends from Florida. Um, and then a couple of guys I met in Alabama that, uh, it was fun to kind of see them come, come down. But, it was a very low key finish, unlike New York City two years before that, and it was just perfect because I did one interview right after I finished, and then it was like straight, uh, straight to shower, and then out to the dinner and the bars, and um, had a lot of fun with a few friends that night, and uh, it was just like, just the way I wanted it. it was so, incredible. so that that was your celebration at, over there, like going to the bar and um, having having dinner with the fam. Yep, That's... yep, yep. Uh, so yeah, it was. It was fun, um, and you know, I only spent a couple nights down in Key West, and uh, my wife and I uh, flew back from Miami uh, pretty quick. But it was, uh, I think it was, an, it was just just right. Yeah, wow, that sounds sounds like like a great way to to actually finish it, and, and you must have must be quite fulfilling after after that journey, and then coming back, and then all of a sudden not running day in day out. How was that transition? Yeah, it, you know, it wasn't, it, you know, I, I think I was I was ready, like I'd mentally prepare myself for some downtime, um, although I'm like itching to get back into like race mode now. Um, but yeah, it was, I think this, the weirdest thing was um, just getting in a car again, like going, I remember, uh, like I had the entire run, um, I made a point to always go everywhere on foot, even if I stayed at someone's house, like two miles there, or two miles east or west or whatever. Hmm. Um, and so just like getting in a car and moving at high speed again was like a shock because it had been 
like three and a half, four months since I'd done that. Um, and, and then, you know, getting back home and driving again, um, you know, it has, you know, with the snow here in Ohio has been kind of a, an adjustment as well, but the, the running, you know, it's coming back and, um, yeah. I, I'm the, I, I don't, I don't really believe in the whole streaker thing. So like, you know, I had like a, a good 90 some day streak, but I was happy to give it up. <laughs> good. Yeah. You're, uh, I, I can imagine that it's good to kind of mix it up after that. Can you, can you talk briefly about some of your lower points? If you look back at your days, I'm sure that there were beautiful runs, beautiful days, but there were, there were quite tough spots as well. Can you talk about that some more? Yeah, um, yeah. There were a couple in particular. Um, I had one in. I remember. I, uh, you know, I didn't have service very often up in the Yukon, but I remember um, coming into Destruction Bay, uh, which is kind of, kind of early on, uh, closer to the Alaska border, and I just had a really a really bad headwind day, and I remember complaining to my wife like this was a six, I think it was like a 60, about a hundred K day, like 62 miles. So it was, it was a little further than the average day, but I had the next day was supposed to be 66. And then the next day after that was supposed to be 83. And then I had some more 70 mile days and just like telling her, like, I don't think I can do this. Like this wind is just destroyed me today. I feel like crap. I'm going to have like an hour off my feet before I had to get to bed, you know, and that hour is going to be taken up by doing my little Instagram post. And then, um, and so I just like, this is like, you know, I want some me time and I'm not getting my me time. I want a, you know, a few hours to kick back and just, you know, look at the lake that I'm, I just mm-hmm. ran by. Um, so that was really stressful. Um, cause I was just like thinking like this headwind, you know, is going to stay with me the rest of Canada. I'm never going to get out of it. It's going to be a pain in the butt every single day. Um, but thankfully, you know, the, the next day was actually a really good day and I bounced back pretty quick. Um, how, how, did I, you, how did you bounce back? Like, how did you, was that self-talk? Was that your wife coming in for support? And in, in what sort of way do you overcome that? I think it was just like going back into race mode. Like there's, during this run, I kind of had like sightseeing mode where I'm just kind of like not worrying about anything. But then every now and then I had to like keep myself honest and just be like, all right, I'm going, I'm getting dinner, going to bed race mode tomorrow wake up for the race wake up early get out the door you know take a couple photos if you have time but just keep moving um and then and then eventually i was able to to get back out of race mode and back into sightseeing mode so um that was good because like the entire run across america in 2016 was race mode i didn't really have i didn't i never never had like sightseeing mode so (laughs) Mm -hmm. so so that was good and you know i met some i met uh a, a few new friends on that day, uh, coming into Haynes Junction. Um, and, uh, you know, that was great too, to, to kind of, you know, meet some new, new people that can kind of like keep, keep your mind, you know, away from like the race mode a little bit as well. Um, get, some, get some fresh energy. Get, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, and it's fun. It's always fun. Cause like a lot of the people on the Alaska highway are like, I met, a, I met so many people that were like college students or like going back to school. Like they lived in Alaska and they're going to school in like Montana or because um, I think they have like you, you can get in-state tuition if you go to school in like Washington, Montana or some Oregon or some of those states from uh, Alaska. So you get a lot of that and there's always, there are a lot of them were runners and kind of curious about what I was doing. So um, that was fun. Um, but an- another challenging day I had was and it actually kind of was I actually kind of got um, th- this kind of tells you about the type of person I am. But um, I had a, a tire that was going flat, um, in, uh, Alberta and this is near white, white, uh, white court. And, um, I, I'll never forget, like just my, my sister was shipping me new tires to my motel and we decided on the motel near, um, Edmonton cause it was a little bigger town. It would probably be a little bit, um, better about getting stuff shipped there. And I had um, I already lost one spare tire, or I already had to put on one my one spare tire because one tire went flat. Um, but then my other tire went flat, and I didn't have any spares. So, <laughs> and it's not just like you can't just like put in a new tube. It's the tire's just gone. I mean, it's shredded. And um, 
because those the shoulders up on the Alaska Highway are a lot rougher than I thought they'd be. Um, and so what I did was I just took my other spare tire, put it back on, or, or, or my sh other shredded tire, put it back on, saved my nice tire so they would balance out. And I literally had right, I was a hun exactly 100 miles away from Port Saskatchewan where my other spare tire was. And so I pushed the stroller on a two, and this stroller is like 70 to 80 pounds fully loaded with water, food, and supplies. And I, I pushed it on two flat tires. It actually wasn't that hard as I thought it'd be, but I was just nervous that like the entire tire was going to shred down to the frame. And um, so that was kind of an interesting wow experience because like my sister and I debated like having someone just like come out on a Saturday or Sunday and uh it was over the weekend and just drive out the spare tire to me but I was like well th then I was like I, in my Instagram the post the next day when I did got my spare tire I was like I kind of mentioned the problem on on social media and um but then I was like well you know I thought to myself you know like what would some of the toughest people you know like Courtney Dowalter or like I get guy I know Todd not like what what would those people do in the situation and like kind of like a what would Jesus do to moment yeah. and I was like they they wouldn't make the call they they would just keep pushing along you know they don't need help from anybody um, so that, that that's a that, that's a good motivator right there <laughs> it, it truly is yeah. like what what would other people do that that yeah. you admire that you respect uh, oh yeah so that was kind of fun you know that was one of the interesting scenarios that that took place. Um, but you know, and, and and from that point on, uh, coming like the la the second half of the run, it was less about logistics and more about um, traffic and just uh, you know, I was on some I, you know, if 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 someone drove the route I r ran, they'd probably be like, he, "There's no way he ran on this highway because <laughs> there are some there are some highways that you know, if I had scouted out the whole, I didn't go scout out the entire route before I ran it and especially like Alabama where I call it RSO um, shoulders, rumble strip only. Um, I was running on very, very narrow shoulders or no shoulders at all. And so um, I was at the mercy of hundreds of thousands of cars um, seeing me. And so that became kind of the biggest struggle uh, the rest of the run. So like, I think from like Minnesota on, it was like, how how good were the shoulders versus how bad was the traffic would kind of determine how good of a day I'd have uh, the rest of the run. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's a tricky one with, with traffic, especially when you have a stroller as well. It's one thing when you're running solo on, a, on the shoulder, but once you have a stroller as well, especially when it's loaded with gear. And for yeah. those listening in the audience, I do want to actually mention this part. Like I have two kids and I run with them in my double stroller. And that does not even add up to the weight that you have been pushing across country. And I've noticed when I measure myself at the same effort, you're slower by, depending on the grade, by one or two minutes per mile. It's what I've noticed, kind of. And I can only imagine the amount of additional effort that you put in because of your stroller. It's, it's a complete different way of running again. Over time, you get used to it, but that definitely takes some getting used to it. Yeah, you know, it, it, that's one thing I was kind of nervous about going in because I'd, I'd only trained with the stroller for maybe, gosh, like 100 to 200 miles total. Um, and so, like, um, I remember the first time I took it out in Missouri with my friend Scott uh, for a day, and uh, I did a 40-miler with it. And, like, I, I was, like, I was switching hands every 10 seconds. I didn't really know what to do. And then, I mean, by the time I got done in Key West, I mean, I was almost exclusively using my right arm because – um, mostly so that if traffic, if a truck came and, um, got close to me, I could just easily veer off, um, to the left with my right hand. Um, but yeah, it was interesting cause like early on in the run, I wasn't really sure which arm to use. And like by the end of the run, like my arm, my right arm was just kind of like stuck <laughs> <laughs> kind of like, a, the, um, the marathon runner that had the world record, Hallie Geberselassie back in the day, he used to, when he was a kid, he ran to school with books in his arm. And so like his form was kind of jacked up ever since because he was so used to having books in one hand uh, so yes yeah, it and, and it, it's weird because like you know I was thinking coming out of it like pushing a stroller would that like have me in like insane superhuman shape after the run and 
The answer, I guess, is no, but um, I like to think, though, it was, you know, in some ways a good muscle builder, um, <laughs> having that little, a little bit of extra stuff to push. <laughs> yeah, and for me, one thing that helped a lot as well is when I'm running with a stroller, I'm, I'm focused on time on my feet. I'm not focused on pace. And I think once you make that switch too, it becomes less stressful and it becomes less hard on yourself and you're just more out there enjoying a, a stroller run for an hour than that you have to hit that seven minute pace or whatever it is. So. Yeah. Yep. And that, that was one thing I liked, you know, I never, you know, I'll be, I hardly any of my miles were under nine minutes. Um, uh, and then if, you know, if there was like a, you know, like a hillier day, I didn't have too many like super high elevation gain days, but you know, if I did, it was like, Oh, it's like, I call them excuse hills. It's like an excuse to just hike on up this big hill. Cause you're pushing like, like it's like you're pushing a lawnmower when you're going up some of those hills. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of like a, it's almost like a, I don't know, like more like a you're lifting weights than you're actually feel like you're a runner in some mm-hmm. of those <laughs> cases. Yeah. yeah, completely, totally. So you've done many different ultra marathons. You have won Badwater twice. Uh, I believe you still have the current course record at Badwater right now, correct? Yep, yep, that's right. So, and then you've done the cross-country run from San Francisco to New York. You've done the Alaska to Florida run. I just have to ask you, what what is your why? What is your motivation? Were there were there any other people who had done it before you that you looked up to? Were there any inspirations, or, or what is it? Yeah, yeah, you know, um, the run across America idea. Well. Um, is you know it kind of goes back when I first started doing ultras in uh, 2011. Um, I went to the you know the Pikes Peak Marathon and I met a guy named Marshall Ulrich there mm-hmm. who was uh, um, presenting um, at the at kind of at, like the the speaker at the expo there in the dinner. And um, you know I never even really heard of the guy before. I was kind of new to the sport and uh, you know he just had this incredible resume. He um, some did the highest peak on every continent um on his first attempt he had won bad water several times and he had uh most notably run across america recently um and was had, had a book that he was um promoting that um was the kind of the story of his run across america in 2008 really, really good book highly recommend yep. it yeah. yep uh yeah running on empty and um so i you know i met him there and it was like i read his book a few times and then um i'd also had the privilege of meeting uh charlie angle and becoming good friends with him uh over the years and he's also done uh runs like that he he ran he did uh running the sahara um <laughs> which was a great documentary uh with uh matt damon narrating um yeah and- actually, actually charlie was one of my previous podcast guests and i actually had a coffee with him he came to visit me yesterday so uh, oh yesterday really yeah he was oh, here cool. yesterday we we're talking about oh, you nice. yesterday all, oh, cool. all good stuff though but a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of long trail running stories as well so yeah awesome yeah and uh and so just like um you know, thinking about like reading, reading about uh, Marshall's Run Across America, and um, and uh, kind of growing up in, in a family of seven, uh, youngest of five kids, uh, we we took road trips everywhere. We never flew because it would just be too expensive. And but we always went on a summer vacation, and like we'd even driven to Alaska before. We'd driven really to pretty much every state you can drive to, and. Um, so like the road trip element was always always kind of been in my blood and so uh reading the, like marshall's run across america story was like i kind of just felt like i'd already done it with him <laughs> in some <laughs> ways like like he was talking about like so many different towns i'd already been to and um you know i'd already started to do some ultras by that point and um so yeah it was just like a no-brainer i had to run across america someday um, and it wasn't really, you know, at the time I was just a novice, you know, ultra runner. And so I didn't really think about the record at all, but then it kind of just kind of came and I know you kind of, I feel like it kind of just landed on in front of me when I, um, uh, got first place at Badwater in 2015. Um, and I remember sitting, <laughs> sitting at the, uh, uh, Whitney, the Whitney, um, portal hostel or, or whatever in Lone Pine, uh, drinking a beer on the balcony with my, uh, with my friend Dill and, and telling him like, all right, a year from now I'm going for that cross America record no matter what. Um, and, uh, yeah, it just kind of came, it just kind of came about from there going for the record. And, 
Um, you know, I, uh, one thing I've always kind of noticed that um, a lot of people, uh, they say they're going to do something, but they don't actually do it. And they have the mm-hmm. qualifications to do something. And um, there's never really a good time. And, uh, you know, I, even though I, even though I broke the course record the next year in 2016 at Badwater, it was a pretty rough year for me because I had, um, very, very severe anemia, um, just three or four months before that. Um, literally couldn't even, I was doing a 44 mile ultra in April. I literally couldn't even make it past mile 10. Um, and I dropped and, uh, just really tough tough year. And, you know, I actually going into that race, I knew I was anemic, but I was just like, what the hell I'm going to do it anyways. And, um, I, and, and, you know, I, I fixed the problem pretty quickly, uh, over those two or three months, I got my iron levels back up to where they needed to be. But so, you know, it wasn't really like the ideal year to go for a record, you know, and, but also timing wise, it worked out pretty well otherwise. And so I just thought I got to do it. You know, it's no, no turning back. Um, just, you're probably never going to get another chance to do it. So, um, did that, but then the more recently running from Alaska to Florida, it's like, uh, (laughs) in ultra running, once you do something, you kind of feel like you're part of like, uh, like a, a terrible, like drug cartel movie, like, uh, breaking bad where you're just like, you've already killed five people. So now you got to kill like 10 more to keep, uh, keep yourself in the, (laughs) the game. But no, it was, um, running from Alaska to Florida, it was like, uh, um, more of like, a, I, you know, everything went perfectly running from San Francisco to New York in 2016. And, uh, but I still felt like this, something was missing, like something huge, like requ- a requirement of running across America. And, um, you know, the biggest thing was like seeing other people do like runs across America and taking pictures, enjoying it. Um, you know, meeting people. And like, I didn't really have any of that. I was just kind mm. of like, in race mode across America and it was over in a blink of an eye. And so that was kind of like my motivation for doing another run across America was, um, you know, you, you have the endurance, you have the, um, you've built up this incredible ability to recover quickly and do tons and tons of miles. So, um, rather than waiting till later when you might be a little more frail, um, you know, do it now. Uh, and, and it worked out. My wife and I were moving again. Um, and so I, I, um, had not had a window to, um, quit my job, um, before we moved to Ohio and then, uh, fit it in, um, over a few months. And, uh, in, you know, this time, you know, I always, you know, I thought about, you know, doing a supported run again, but it's like, you know, what's, what's the point, you know, like you, I wanted to go about it differently and have a chance to really document it for myself. Um, and others, uh, if they're interested in following along. And so, um, I kind of came to the conclusion, the only way to both challenge myself to do something more extreme and enjoy it a little bit, uh, do a little bit of sightseeing instead of race mode all the time was to make it further. And the only way to really do that was to do the, Ala- then the Alaska idea popped into my head. And so it's kind of like one of those, like one thing leads to another, yeah. um, decisions. And so, I, but then like, I just fell in love with it. Um, like from, uh, this time last year until, um, till the spring and summer when I got the, got the wheels on the pavement. What can you possibly do after this? Uh, you know, <laughs> I don't, I'll never say I'm never doing another type of like transcon again, but I want to get, I want to get fast and I want to, uh, again, cause I, I feel like. I'm, I have an incredible like fuel efficiency on a certain gear right now. Um, but I want to get some of those faster gears back and I'm already starting to kind of work on that. Um, I'd love to, you know, I'm I'm craving competition, like so much. So I I think I'm craving so much competition so much is that I I created that fake competition at the end of the key to key. Like I got to I got to like challenge finish, finish strong finish yeah. strong um and then and then i did a, a 24-hour track race in georgia a couple weeks ago i i i didn't do i i i wasn't even really competitive but um more did it for fun but then like the last four miles i was chasing down a guy uh a, a friend of mine and like i was like literally just like killing myself to catch him so like i really will i think i'm just really craving um that co- competitive aspect again so i think i really want to like start going for um going all out for some 
some of like the fixed time records and just kind of get back out on some of the trail races as well and start doing some local trail races here in Ohio. But, um, the 24 hour race kind of lingers over me as I'm um, getting back on the U S 24 hour team. I'd love to do that. And, uh, I'm signed up for a six day race, um, this summer, uh, kind of the, the, uh, redux of the, um, the, uh, six days in the dome from Alaska now in, uh, moved to, uh, Milwaukee in August. And so I, I'd love to, to do well there and really shoot for, um, shoot, shoot for some high miles. It should be a, a heavy, intense race as well, I'm sure, but, but a fun yeah. one. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But I, I did a, I did my first six day race this year, early this year, and it didn't turn out the way I wanted it to be. But at the same time, it was like such a cool experience that, um, yeah, it's, it's just, they're just like, they're just, that's the thing about ultra running. There's just so many different places to go, not just physically, but just mentally. <laughs> oh, and, and the whole community aspect about it as well of those races of everyone coming, coming out and you're not competing against others. You truly it's only one part of it. You're competing against yourself and just the whole community feel. It's, it's great to be there. Yep. Absolutely. Good. Um, just want to finish it up over here. Last, last few questions. Um, what do you think people who are listening right here, who are training for a half marathon or, or, or a marathon or even an ultra, what do you think they can do to, to dream big and to, to really aim beyond what they're, thinking they're capable of um you know i think just just having uh like having some really long-term goals um you know i i never you know i've one of the things i always say is like i when i'm running i i don't i don't know also like i don't know where i'm running to but i know how to get there type of thing like don't like you know don't set yourself like you know if if you you know have some struggles like don't um, like don't see it as like the end of the world. If you have a bad race, like I've had tons of bad races, I would say less than half of my races go to the way I'm planning. So, um, you know, I, and I think, uh, just kind of getting out there as well. Like, um, you know, I think one of my favorite things about running is there's a different reason I do it every year. So like some years you might want to be competitive other years, just go, you know, use it as like a va re excuse to go vacation to like somewhere you wouldn't normally go. Like I've, I've taken running to like the Salton Sea in California and like um, Belfast, Ireland. And, you know, it's a great place to go, but I probably wouldn't have otherwise gone there and just, you know, kind of use running to do more for you than just like one thing, like look at it, look at it holistically. And uh, when you're thinking about like what races you want to do and, um, you know, what type of distance you want to do as well. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think that part, just not putting, like for me, kind of as an extension of what you just said, knowing in advance that some of these races might not go according to plan. And actually, yeah, you have a plan there, but everything can happen. And knowing in advance that everything can happen, you're a little bit more open to it uh, than getting bummed out when something doesn't go according to plan. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, and not even have like a plan B and C, but have a plan like D, E and F because <laughs> like, I, especially at uh, like, like 24 hour races, it's like a classic example. Like everybody at the start line, maybe one tenth of the people at the start line do what they like, actually like the over under what they think they, they want to do. And it's just, you know, sometimes you can surprise yourself, but it's just like a lot of times, you know, something's not going to go the way you want it. And, uh, just, just knowing that like, be ready for anything, you know, no matter what, like, you know, if you do the Boston marathon, be ready for it to be terrible weather nine out of 10 years <laughs> and things like that. And just, um, you know, if, if some, if the race day isn't what you thought it'd be, you know, still, still have fun with it. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. Good. Last question. Where can people find out more about you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I post a lot of stuff on, uh, Instagram, uh, just my name, Pete Kostelnik. Um, also, uh, Facebook, um, I have like the, the Pete's feet, uh, across America, F E E T across America. Um, and then, yeah, I, po I post all my runs on Strava. So Strava is probably the place where I, I'm active just about every day, as long as I'm, if I'm running, I'm on Strava. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's about it though. <laughs> Good. Well, uh, definitely make sure to link to all of that in the show notes. Do you have any parting words, any, any, anything you would like to say at the end to the audience here? 
Uh, you know, 2019, make it your year. Don't wait till I, I know a lot of people. I, I've already heard a lot of people saying like 2020, I'm doing Boston 2020. I'm doing this and that, but Hey, 2019 is the year to sneak in there and, uh, make it happen without all the, the glorious, uh, fanfare. So, uh, yeah, make it a great year. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. We'll definitely, uh, share that message. Pete, thank you so much. It was a pleasure having you on the show and I uh, hope we can connect again further down the line. You bet. Thanks, buddy. All right. Have a good one, mate. Later. Yep. Later. Hi, guys. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Extra Mileage Show with Pete Kostelnik. As always, all of the show notes can be found on my website, extramilest.com. And if you have any questions after hearing today's episode, please let me know in the comments. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to connecting with you soon again.